Welcome back to The Great Indoors. Before we dive into today's interview, I want to tell you about our next season, which will be recorded live at MWC Barcelona from February the 26th to the 29th. You'll hear from industry experts, explore new innovations, and gain new insight into the world of connectivity. New episodes coming early March, wherever you get your podcasts. Yes, you've guessed it, TGI is back in Las Vegas. Welcome to The Great Indoors, a podcast where we look at the technological implications brought about by the next industrial revolution and how this can potentially help solve the biggest problems facing humanity. I'm your host, Matt Roberts, and joining me is my co-pilot and producer, Larissa Yi, and this time, some even more special guests. So for this new season, we have episodes that focus specifically on Canada and also interviews that we recorded at MWC Las Vegas this year. And that's where we'll start today, in fabulous Las Vegas. And for the third year in a row, The Great Indoors is the GSMA's official podcast for MWC Las Vegas, the biggest technology and telecom show in the United States. Unfortunately, however, for various reasons, I couldn't make the trip to Nevada this year, so I asked a good friend to help me out, and that good friend is Amdocs' own Mike McDade. Now, Mike hosts his own Amdocs podcast, Your Career, Is It Choice or Chance? And that's why he's a perfect stand-in to join the TGA family for this special week. So I'm really excited to introduce Mike to the family. I know he's had a great time in Las Vegas with some great guests. So take it away, Mike. Thank you, Matt. You are right. I am thrilled to be hosting the podcast from wonderful Las Vegas. It was a terrible sacrifice for me to go to Las Vegas, I have to be honest. I went with high aspirations, and I returned with, with less money than what I started with. So, But I guess this is the uh, the moral of the Las Vegas story, right? So I did want to highlight before we start that one of the new things that we introduced this season is the TGI Open Mic. And with the TGI Open Mic, we opened the great indoors to the wider population at MWC Las Vegas. Uh, to get the pulse of everything that they were hearing, they were thinking, they were seeing, we invited all of the attendees to join us there and to share their viewpoints on the hottest topics of the day across the wide world of technology. In this episode, I'm joined by Joe Constantine, the Chief Technology and Strategy Officer at JMA Wireless. I had a great discussion with Joe. We talked about 5G and telecom leadership in the United States and how they research and develop and manufacture their solutions here. We talked a little bit about where he thinks 5G is going and particularly where private networks are going in the next 12 months and what role they hope to play at JMA Wireless in that space. And we talked a little bit about the role of the industry and, and in JMA Wireless specifically on connectivity as a basic human right and how they think about that in the context of their mission. So it was a really interesting discussion and I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to MWC 23 Las Vegas. My name is Mike McDade and you are listening to the Great Indoors podcast. I am super excited for this week. We have a killer lineup of guests. I am delighted to be joined by my first guest, Joe Constantine. Joe is the Chief Technology and Strategy Officer at JMA Wireless. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We're excited you're here. The JMA uh, booth is quite impressive. It's uh, it's very nice. It's one of the one of the nicest ones I saw in the hall. And I'm sure I'm going to walk through seeing the demos later. I, I need to uh, need to see it in action, right? So, so thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. Can I start by just asking you to give a little background uh, on yourself, kind of where you came from, what who JMA is, what you what you do in that company, that kind of thing. So again, I'm Joe Constantine. I'm the Chief Technology and Strategy Officer for JMA Wireless. I overlook our R and D and technology direction for the company. I've been in this industry as many of us uh, for two and a half. Around for a while, <laughs> yeah, right? We all two and a half. Around. Decades worked in five continents from 2G to 5G and hopefully 6G in the future. Oh, yep. I work for JMA Wireless again. JMA is the only company that does research, development, and manufacturing in the United States. We are committed as a company to restore U.S. leadership in telecom. As we know, 5G is not only a, a technology, it's also national security and it's to, to protect our country and our future. Sure, sure, it's, uh, it's super interesting. And I, and I have to say, when I was, I was reviewing, uh, I, I, obviously I took a look at JMA's website and, and, and uh, I mentioned I walked through the booth, and one of the things 
that, that you guys touch on is, is this kind of idea of a connected world being a, a basic human right or, or something that people should uh, should have access to. So, you know, I come from a slightly different perspective, right? At MDOTS, we're, we're a, a primarily a software-centric uh, organization, right? And as a B2B vendor in the software space, we, we talk about connecting the world through technology, right? And, and that technology takes lots of different forms. I presume that JMA has a slightly different spin on this given the, given the hardware and software footprint that you guys have. So I, I'd be interested in, in hearing, you know, how you think about building this, this globally connected world. Technology or broadband is human rights very, very personal to me uh, as an individual. Uh, we know for a fact that where you have broadband, Unemployment rate goes down, uh, crime rate goes down, literacy goes up, GDP goes up. So, so there is a clear connection. There are studies that show that where you have broadband, you literally driving a society to grow. So, so that, that, that's really the, the basic foundation of broadband and connectivity. For me, the way I see it, it it's a basic human right, the same way if we go maybe couple of centuries where people didn't have access to, which we believe is a basic human right today, sure. sewers, water, right. electricity, etc. We can't imagine a world today without these basic needs the same way as is, is, is with broadband. Now, your second question is, what, what are we doing about affordable broadband for connectivity for everyone? We know today that if we look at any earnings report from, from big CSPs, yeah. that every dollar spent on capital investment, you have a few dollars, we can debate is it two or four, sure. uh, on operational expenses. There's a lot of manual work that's happening to operate and run these networks. From a technology inception to full-scale deployments, roughly 36 months today, there is a great inefficiencies in how we, we, we run networks, what drive the cost down, mm -hmm. right. and this is hitting the, the consumers. Obviously, we can afford it in the Western world, given you know our GDP growth, uh, etc. The, the second point is the telecom industry has been built on a similar technology trends since you know the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Very little, I would say, advancement has happened, especially in the transmission layer. We still use static algorithms, if else then. Add on top of it what's happening in the world around us, it's more important than ever now with power consumption to have sustainable products Perfect. and make sure they are very, very, very efficient. The third piece is how networks are built today. They built on a special purpose built hardware that do specialized tasks and have very little flexibility of deployment. Add all these together, it makes actually the telecom industry quite inaffordable outside I would say the industrial sure. world. Uh, so what are we doing about this? If you build a technology and you come from an angle saying, I'm not going to build it the same way that everyone has done. That's why we say we are different by design. Sure. Uh, to vector out and come back in, if you look at newer companies, newer technology, cloud companies, by design, they start building technologies where it's affordable for everyone. It's easy deployable and uh, operated without any almost human touch. Sure. So if we take that angle from it and saying, we're going to build a technology that has no ties to hardware architecture, no software architecture, and own and build our own stack from layer one to layer three, that can run on any processor technology. So we can run today on AMD, ARM, or Intel. Sure. If you run on any cloud, public, private, or hybrid, if you run on any cast layer, this is really, really important. It gives you that flexibility yep. to multi-level agnosticity, right, that you can, uh, that you can miss for flex. So you can scale horizontal, vertical yep. in, any, in, any, in any environment. Sure. You could literally, I could literally say, hey, give me storage, compute, and memory, I'll give you performance. Sure. Uh, that is actually quite endless possibilities to drive sustainable and affordable uh, sure. telecommunication. I don't like talking about the pandemic. We've all been doing it for a long time, right? I think we all got tired of uh, hearing about it. But, you know, one of the things that we, we saw emphasized, right, and continue to see emphasized is this kind of backbone functionality of connectivity around the world. Right? We, we obviously saw uh, where we had significant gaps in that, right, in, in the last few years. 
uh, and where we needed to make up a lot of ground as an industry, right? Not not just as uh, as individual companies. So obviously, we I think we all see that there's a need for for more flexibility, specifically in the network, and that the kind of uh, cost variables have to come down, right? As as we move forward to make that access more more efficient and more affordable for different regions, different population segments, that kind of thing. So it makes a lot of sense. So. We, we kind of went round the horn on, uh, on on a little bit of a back alley view of, of JMA. So I, I want to go maybe a little bit more direct now. So uh, in your day job, you know, what are you building? What are you focused on? What are you excited about? What's the what's the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning? Oh, many things. But <laughs> <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, we have a quite unique software stack. And one of the things we're doing this year, and of course going to continue, is to fulfill the promise of our 5G and, and, and software. So what we are doing, we are developing a, a new architecture called SPMA, Service Based and Management Architecture. Yep. It's data driven, where we basically want to fulfill this zero touch provisioning, zero human interaction, day zero, day one, and day two, sure. and drive down RAN uh, intelligence down to the RAN. Sure. It's very, very, very crucial to, to do so. As I said earlier, if we cannot drive out inefficiencies, we can't use algorithms that say if, else, then. We need to be able to use automated frameworks. So that is something It's very, very, very important, very meaningful, a large investment from the company. And we will be world first with actually a complete set of operational tools. Sure. The second, we announced a couple of months ago, I would say, a, a collaboration with MIT, okay, where we are going to solve a very, very critical uh, industrial issue we have today, which is to really unleash a true ultra reliable low latency. We can, the industry can achieve low latency today, but not reliably. Yep. And to be able to fulfill the promise of 5G, where 5G is not only for humans or for a, a certain set of applications, but also for mission critical that needs very, very low latency and on top of it, reliable. We're doing this by optimizing the transmission layer okay. that the telecom industry believes it is optimized. <laughs> it's a wonderful journey. It's an exciting space. Yep. TGI. Open mic. Hi, my name is Blake Cooklin with IBM. I focus on IBM Automation Solutions. So IBM Automation will take those entities and help bring them in the fold. It will take disparate processes, disparate uh, technologies and automate them. It'll also do some monitoring around some of those technologies. So you have one center to be able to monitor many, many aspects of the business versus a lot of disparate entities. It's very cost inefficient. It's very hard to find solutions or breaking points when you have a bunch of disparate locations. Bring in IBM Automation, use some machine learning in there to help not just do some of the automated tasks, but tell you why these things are happening and how you might change to be, become more efficient. It affects cost, it affects people power, whether it's you know, hands-on or, or just simple mundane daily tasks up to very technical, very deep requirements, right? It, it can address a lot of those things. In the IBM automation space, it, it looks at a lot of things. I want to touch on something you said. So you mentioned the, this kind of, I'll call it the next level of maturity in 5G's journey, right? Which is kind of where we are now. So, it, you know, one of the big things that, that obviously we, we collectively have been talking about for a few years is, is the general 5G monetization narrative. Right now, before, you know, 5G was widespread, we, we talked about the consumer use cases. We then, I think everyone realized that wasn't uh, going to drive the business that I think most of the service providers expected and even in the enterprise uh, space. Uh, and then we saw the kind of shift right towards the enterprise domain and, and uh, obviously I know JMA does a lot of work in this in this domain and a lot of different flavors. So I wondered if you could give us uh, maybe a snapshot of a, or a couple examples of you know when you think about 5G's use in the enterprise vertical, right? What that looks like or, or what do you see as uh, maybe some of the most exciting uh, examples there? It just reflects a bit where 5G is and where 5G isn't. If we look at 
the adoption in the United States is 40 percent, roughly. Um, Europe is 20 percent. China is, is extremely high. And that goes back a little bit to the spectrum allocation. Sure. We get millimeter wave in the United States. Uh, China get wind band. Different economies of scale there. Uh, yeah. How much? How much you can actually cover, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so we know also that in China today, they 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 roughly have uh, added 70 billion US dollars from industrial IoT. Sure. Uh, if we take a parallel to to 4G, if we go back to 4G 2010, at the time the the, the carriers were monetizing SMS or text messages and voice, and we said as an industry. Well, they can monetize data too. And by accident, our friends in California made trillion dollar companies. And that happened because you had really widespread and you have access nationwide. Sure. So I'm a big believer that 5G uh, is going to deliver on a promise. We know today our booth is stable and, and then it's being monetized across the Western world, not only in, in China. Now, the, the critical path of this is there are many promises and we used to talk about the eight currencies of 5G. Right, right. Some of those hasn't really materialized yet. We need to drive down the cost of, of, of the chipsets uh, today. It's, it's the majority of the investment are happening for, for devices, which is you know, around a thousand dollar device. So there are some maturity that need to happen in that space. But more importantly, we need to have and full promises to have that one horizontal network sure. that's going to replace all these vertical networks. And you can't do it today when you have a tie-in between hardware and software and then what the industry is doing every two, three years, refreshing those 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 different hardwares sure. that have one specific use case. So when we look at, the, at 5G and the enterprise or private wireless in general, if you have a special purpose-built hardware to do certain applications, mm -hmm. Well, obviously, that's not scale. Sure. So, so great examples of, of the indoor or private wireless in general could be indoor-outdoor is the flexibility of the platform. If you look at certain things we, we, we are doing in JMA, which we call it Wi-Fi without wires, for instance. Now, going and replacing cables in old structures is sure. very, very expensive right. endeavor. Uh, so why would you do this? You can actually replace all these with, with modern technology. Sure. Once you do so, then you, you, you are going to discover a lot of applicability if you are on a university campus, if you are in sports and entertainment, and you start adding to that beautiful horizontal platform a, a bunch of new applications. Gun detection, for instance. Today, we have vision technology sure. coupled with AI detects if someone is carrying a gun. Sure. It's actually how you, how you move. I learned this the other day. That it's how, how you body shape it. Yeah. So even if you happen to miss that individual with, with a gun, there is a second level of gun detection. Sure. Because the sound of a bullet obviously is different than any other sure. thing. Yeah. So we have these, these very, very, very important early, early warnings. Digital transformation is happening with that horizontal platform. We know today is only 13% of our industry, our world, it has actually transformed digitally. Sure. Yeah. Still 87% lots of go. opportunities. Still There's a lot yeah. of opportunities to go. The question is, do you have that flexible platform that's going to operate as this with Solomonite? I guess I would add to your, your comment that we see that both on obviously in, in, on the network side and the IT side, right? We, we see this opportunity to to make it a more um, accessible network ecosystem, right? And, and to be able to expose certain elements of the network to, to build different use cases, different vertical capabilities on top of the network, right? So I think uh, it's, it's something we also see uh, in our in our day day jobs as well, right? So yeah, I, I feel like we're like maybe early in the private network maturity curve, right? Like we see now that. There's certainly agile, you know, MPN in a box type of things, right? And, and, and vertical focus solutions and things like that. But in your mind, everything that can't be uh, softwareized long term, like you feel like we're going on a curve where it all becomes progressively more and more software even in the MPN space or the bet or private enterprise network space. Absolutely, I, I think. I mean, just look at all the networks we have today. Sure. From a fixed wireless to to broadband sure. to uh, push the talk to I mean, yeah. like the service you like, like any yeah. service yeah. you want. These are really vertical networks, uh, very heavy operations. So the question is, all these networks are doing similar tasks. Sure. They literally transmitting some bits from sure. one hand to different end with different purposes. Right. 
this is what these all these networks are doing. Now, if you we have a, a network keep drumming the, 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 the horizontal part and the horizontality of, of 5G is goes down to quality of service, uh, an end user experience. Right, right. Can you cater this network to deliver all these different special purpose vertical sure. networks? Right. So that's really the promise of flight. You have different levels of criticality across the same horizontal. Correct. Network. I mean, yep. Yep. Some of them need high throughput, others need for latencies. So the, the answer, the short answer to the question is yes. Sure. I truly believe the, the promise of 5G and beyond is to replace all these vertical networks and to make that, that platform, like as I said, a Swiss army knife, sure. uh, to, to cater for every single need. Yeah. Uh, I think we need to replace the word end user experience to the quality of experience. Right. If you can provide the quality of experience, then the means, the medium, becomes less. So important. it's simply a lever of the scale, right? Yeah, just pull it if you want more and, and or need more, right? In case of hospitals or a node surgery or something like that. So it's an exciting future vision, right, of, of the world. So I want to ask a bit of a trick question. So we've been talking a lot about 5G, right, the 5G evolution, how where we are monetization, how, how uh, enterprise is evolving in that context. So in, in the last couple of years, we, we obviously discussions around 6G have ramped up, right? We, we hear more murmurs about this coming, although I, I have to be like, as a selfish uh, lay person, I have to say that like, it feels so premature to me. Like, I know we need to think about it. I know companies are working on it. So I'm, I'm curious on your take, like when is the right time? Who's looking at it? Why, why should we be looking at it? Uh, should we care? That kind of thing. So that uh, just curious what your what your view is. It's all the above, actually. I'm very excited about the, the promise of, of 6G. If we take 6G at its broad definition, we need to find new spec for massive, sure. which we, 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 we don't have today. It's very scarce. So, so we're going to go to very, very high frequency. Then you need different mechanics to operate those reduced frequencies. If we put this aside, which is not a small thing, sure. but if we look at the full promise of it, there's a lot of automation. It, it's happening in the space, a lot of AI. Uh, if you look at the the transmission layer today. One of the great things of AI is if you have data lakes, you can make predictive decisions. Sure. Uh, if you look at the transmission layer that operates on, on a fraction of a millisecond, every millisecond you have data lakes to make a lot of decisions. And we still today make decisions with static algorithms. So there is a lot of inefficiencies in the RAM network that I believe we will be catered fighting and beyond as your yeah, 6G will mature uh, as we go. So that part of 6G, the, the, the automation, the zero touch provisioning, catering for day one, day zero, day one, day two, those are very, very, very critical elements for me in, in, in 6G. Obviously, we have to go to very high frequencies. People talk about 60 and 70 and 80 gigahertz. That will drive and that technology. One of our antennas, we gained 12 patents for one antenna. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, just recently, one antenna. So it's going to drive a lot of antenna technology uh, in the future because you go to 60, 70, 80 gigahertz. Sure. Yeah. You have to have a lot of antennas. Sure. Uh, and those have to be affordable. They have to be easy to deploy, yeah. easy yeah. to replace, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. It, it's uh, so, so good. It's nice to have a, an informed perspective on it because I think people got really tired of hearing the 5G. The, the, people like me, when we're on the end of the user experience, right, got, got a little tired of hearing the uh, 5G noise and not seeing, you know, huge benefits on day one, I think, in a lot of cases, right? So uh, this idea that 6G is coming and it's going to be an exciting thing, I, I think, is, is falling on uh, maybe some early deaf ears. But let, let's let's see how things evolve uh, uh, in the next few years. I, I want to, and, and I think this plays into a comment you made about the, the evolution of the RAN specifically. You know, obviously BRAN and ORAN have been topics in the industry for, for a long time. I, I think we see generally more maturity in, in uh, BRAN today with growing maturity on the ORAN side. So I'm curious your your perspective and, and how you maybe see that rolling into this 5G to 6G life cycle, right? Like how how, uh, how you see some of that technology being transformed, if you would. Well, I mean, I think the first step in ORAN is to have a fully virtually cloud-native uh, software that doesn't have any ties to any reference architecture, hardware, or software, which we have in, in, in JMA. Sure. We just came out, out of the NTIA and the OUSD 5G challenge last week. It was actually remarkable. We were called paired with a, a radio ORU company, and within three days, we were up and running with their yeah, cool. like three days. I could tell you, even within my own R&D that I oversee, 
I have my software based man department and I have my, sure. my hardware department. It will take us more than three days right, to, right, right. To, yeah. to, to actually integrate the radio. That tells you there's an incredible maturity in aura and in the specifications for the front hold. So from that standpoint, I believe that we are ready for prime time for, for ORAN, prime A, VCU, VDU, sure. separation, and, and an ORU. Yep. Now, the abstraction layer on top, which is refers to as the SMO, near real-time break and, and non-real-time break, there is more, more work to be done. But that's not actually preventing us from deploying, because we've been deploying with proprietary OSS systems for the last 40 years. So there is no reason we can't actually mix and match uh, best of breed of components. There are examples in Asia, in Europe, in the US with large scale deployments. We are deploying ORAN both in Europe and the United States. Yep. It's actually with the, the US government, uh, with DOD and Marine Corps Albany and in, in Woodby Island. So there is a maturity and there is an adoption in this space. There are forces in the industry that are saying ORAN is not ready. Yes. It needs to be sure. And, and here's my, my counter argument. If we would have used the same argument for 4G, sure. we would never have deployed it in 2010. We probably would have deployed it in 2018 or 2020. So every technology takes time to mature. The first time we deployed 4G or 3G, I remember the 3G days, we had 15% drop for rate sure. when we deployed it You know, the first time. And then we came down to literally 0.1% drop for rate. So there is a maturity cycle for every technology. ORAN, was built, when was the inception? 2018, 2019? 2017, but I, I might be off on my... Uh, yeah. So we are four or five years into yep. this journey. Yep. And remarkably, we get cold paired with a radio vendor, we're up and running in two days. That's great. That's very good. It's uh, proof of what uh, what can be happening. Obviously, we see we, we have some uh, trials going on in the UK as well, and we're, and we're familiar with some of the uh, developments in that space, so, but it's good to see uh, momentum across the board, right? This is, uh, this is what it's all about, so. I want to switch gears because I, I think uh, it's a topic that, that I can't avoid these days on, on our podcast, right? So everybody, you know, there's a lot of buzz lately on, on artificial intelligence in general, right? Generative AI specifically is, is like uh, the, the buzzword of the week or the, the last nine months or whatever. No one at this conference, I'm sure, hasn't uh, accessed ChatGPT on their phone, and, and uh, which is a bit scary in and of itself, but <laughs> this is where we are. So I, I, I'm curious, you know, in, in your world, right, it, it, we can talk about generally uh, generally artificial intelligence, but also specifically generative AI, uh, if you have a take on how that's going to influence the, you know, the automation of networks, the, op the operations, that kind of thing. Interestingly, automation has been part of, of the human evolution sure. uh, since the, the, the inception of humanity. We went from crawling to walking to having a bicycle, which is an automated sure. vehicle, a form of automation, automation, right? right. The form of automation to going to outer space to actually send things out in the space and get them back to Earth. So automation is not new or not. Today, AI or Gen AI is, is in my opinion, is a beautiful technology for anomaly detection. Uh, if you take an example outside telecom, earthquake today, we, we don't feel or can even detect anything below 2.5 sure. on a richer scale. What scientists are doing globally now, they're actually recording even the small ones that happens every second globally. With those, we are grabbing way, way, way more information and not only to understand how earthquake happens, but also eventually we, we going to have an early warning that it is going to happen. So that's one, one part that it is remarkable is happening around us by gathering a huge amount of data and being able to process it and have insightful outcomes. The second piece is forestry. Without forestry, we would die sure. uh, as, as human beings. We won't exist. It, it's, it's very, very important to understand how forestry recover from natural disasters, drought or uh, hurricanes, yep. etc. Gather all that data, then we can actually restore our insight in, in very, very yep. insightful. Last but not least, which is AI for good, in my opinion, is, sure. is, is the, the food supply. Yep. It, it, the population is, is on a rise. We know for a fact that, that there are some prophecies saying we won't have enough food at a certain uh, time. Using AI, using all the data lakes around, around our uh, agriculture, we are most likely going to, to be able to, to prevent what we believe is going, going to happen in those. So, so that, that's one part I think is remarkable. It's happening. 
we've always had machine learning, we've always had right. automations. Right. If we look specifically about telecom and, and AI in general, I'm very skeptic to uh, how telecom has evolved given its sister technology, cloud technologies, cloud companies. If you take, for instance, a, some, some of the, the, the hyperscalers, they have three, 400 people that's on the global network. While we have three, 400 people in the north monitoring 2,000 base sure. stations. Right. Right. <laughs> so right. they actually built the technology with, with automation in mind right. where no human interaction. The only human interaction is when things fail. And if they fail and you have human interaction, you make sure you're never again going to touch it for that purpose. Third, which is very important part, is capacity planning sure. that is based on, on data lakes. So you're practically taking down costs, greater efficiencies, lower power consumption. That hasn't happened in, in telecom world. Every time you, not every time, but oftentimes when you open your Spotify, if you use Spotify, it starts up differently. Sure. That's cloud technology. Right. The anecdote in the industry was basically Netflix have 1,000 updates every single day while you're watching a movie. Right. Uh, in the telecom industry today, it takes us literally 36 months from right. something developed to be rolled out. It has to go through testings and labs and first office applications, etc. So AI is a must to drive out cost to you efficiencies and to, to basically drive time to market and monetize uh, that, that way and make it affordable for the underserved. Sure. Uh, as well. It's a privilege today, it should be human right. TGI. Open mic. Hi, uh, my name is Gabby. I work for Vodafone as a cybersecurity specialist. I am uh, here this week to talk about quantum computing and risk management, so I'm super excited. And I have to tell you what the most life-changing tech for good examples that I've come across. The one I have is my personal favorite. It's something that we actually implemented in Romania, which is where I'm from. And it's a network of devices across forests. Yeah, I know it sounds really far out there. Now, these devices listen to ultra weird noises such as chainsaws and the minute that they pick up something like that they alert the authorities so that this doesn't actually happen now it's a great way to you know change our lives for the better long term but it's also a great way short term to make sure that we save our forests and you know we all agree that's important right And, and you touched on an important point, right? Because I think th there's so much buzz around AI in general, and, and I, again, specifically of generative AI. And I think people forget that there was an entire industry of AI, right, before, right, that still exists, that still has an important role. And all of the, the, the subtypes, right, natural language processing, machine learning, and even RPA, which is like on the yeah. maybe the junior side of things, right, they still provide and have the potential to provide huge scale, right, and, and huge benefits for uh, the cost of operating networks and things like that. And you know, generative AI is the, the latest and greatest in the uh, the rounds of technology. I liken it ironically to the to the kind of cloud evolution that you mentioned in a, in a different context, right? Uh, lots of excitement around it. Lots of providers getting involved, hyperscalers, and everybody else. And, you know, including Mbox, we have our own uh, our own spin on the story. I think we all see potential for it to be hugely beneficial with the right guardrails, right? With the right training, that kind of thing. Uh, certainly in the network space, you know, I, I think the the designing could portion of the networks, right? The actual deployment and the, and the resolution of issues with quality of experience, all super interesting use cases for generative AI. If we, as an industry, we can get it right, right? Uh, I am encouraged, I have to tell you that, that I, I see, at least from our perspective, we, we see people moving quickly here. We see our customers moving quickly here. You know, time will tell how, how mature the technology gets, right? Everybody's, everybody that's investing in the underlying infrastructure is spending tens of billions of dollars, right? So, so we have to see how, uh, how things evolve over time, right? But I am excited about it. I think it's heading the right direction. So uh, I think the the elephant in the room is machines going to take over, right? Sure, <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. No, maybe this should have been one of our questions. I, I agree. In every industrial revolution, it was always a worrisome in the society that, that the, the industrial revolution, it, it's every revolution of new technology, people sure. get worried. Actually, jobs being not replaced, it's being shifted to different places. Yeah. As I said earlier, one of the greatest pieces of, of AI for me is anomaly detection. Sure. 
any network today, and you guys operate networks globally, any network today has thousands and millions of alarms constantly sure. every single day. It's almost impossible to correlate all these alarms. Uh, even if you're the greatest mathematician or the greatest brains and super sharp as a human, it's, it's almost impossible to do it. If you have data lakes, if you have all these, you can correlate them. Not only correlate them to efficiently monitor network sure. or drive these networks or run these networks, right. you can also bring back information back to R&D. Sure. What are the things we need to do and how to improve how address those, to address those. Yeah. Yeah. There's a disconnect today, in my opinion, at least in telecom, between what happens in the field and in sure. R&D. Sure. As an occurrence, right, is the thing that happens yeah. that we have to address Versus a, you know, a root like cause prevent in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, and I think some, you know, like certain implementations have that dynamic, right? Like they have, it, it ends up being a use case for the platform, right? Whatever the platform is. Uh, and in that way, it kind of gets looped back in. But, you know, it's it's maybe never part of the infrastructure fabric, right? Like it's never never baked into the uh, to the foundation, right? I, I want to talk about the next 12 months. It, it, do you have, you know, a prediction, something something you'd like to see happen in the next 12 months, something you're, you know, we talked a little bit about what you're excited about, but is there a milestone in your mind or something that uh, you're looking forward to? My prediction is that next 12 months, 12 months like a short period sure, in, sure. in technology. I think oh, you we, said three days we can uh, build uh, right. the next generation, right? So that's true. <laughs> that is true. I have to eat my own dog food, yes. <laughs> I think higher adoption of 5G is, is going to take place for sure. sure. I believe we're going to start seeing low-end uh, chipsets for industrial IoT sure. in, in the Western world, not only in China. I foresee a, a higher... Uh, network rollout with, with not traditional hardware. And I also foresee a, a maturity in the uh, private wireless space, sure. specifically in sports and entertainment, higher ed, and hospitality. So the, uh, as a major uh, vertical focus yeah. areas within. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I think uh, well, I was glancing around the, the, the space here today, and I saw a lot of sporting exhibit uh, uh, displays, lots of stadiums, lots of which I know uh, you guys also have some experience with. And, Seems like a logical focus area, right? Hit a hit a lot, a large amount of people at uh, at one time, where the experience is super important, right? Uh, and you can offer some interesting uh, benefits. So, so it's uh, it's great. Okay, last thing for before I let you go. So we have uh, something we call TGI to go. It's a kind of a rapid fire, fun, off the cuff response thing. There's no there's no wrong and right answers. Uh, it's it's up to you. TGI to go. First question. Uh, Rod Stewart or Donny Osmond? Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart. But you know, Donny Osmond is still like here, and he's he's got like a res. He's got to be 120 years old. Like, yeah, I think he has nicer teeth nice than phone. me, but but he's uh, he's here in Vegas. So, second, uh, lobster roll or fish and chips? Oh, that's a close tie. I would say fish and chips. <laughs> okay, fair enough. It'll, it'll make our, uh, so Matt Roberts, who normally runs our podcast, is a uh, British gentleman, and he'll, he'll, he'll appreciate that answer. The raft in a newspaper. The, the, oh, the, the original way, right? The, the original way. way it should be. Third question, Stockholm or Seoul? Stockholm is home, so yeah, yeah, Stockholm A little, a little uh, <laughs> personal. I didn't know where you'd go with it, so. Uh, you know, I lived in, in Seoul, too, so sure. that's Stockholm, yeah. Got it, got it. Uh, Paris or London? I'll give you an easier one. So this one's... Uh, Paris is my second home. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. All right. I studied at the Sorbonne. Oh, okay. So then, then it makes sense. Then, then I, then I, uh, okay. And then, uh, Yukon or Georgetown? Can I pass? I was going to say, you can say neither, but, uh, <laughs> there's no right or wrong. So I'm okay. We can pass. It's no problem. So Joe, thank you very much for joining us. We know you have a busy schedule here. Really thank appreciate you taking the time. I'm excited. I'm going to come over to the, uh, yeah, sure. the demos and the, uh, and some you. of the chats later today. Uh, and we really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. Thank great. you. Hopefully you can tell I had a great time talking with Joe in that episode. We covered a lot of ground in terms of 5G's evolution and private networks and what future industry promise looks like. If you enjoyed that episode, please be sure to leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you'd like to learn more, please go to mdocs.com forward slash the great indoors. Thanks for listening.